Hello, my little friends. Welcome to another episode of Hashtag Beer Time. This is a special episode because we don't touch too much on beer, but we talk about moonshine. What the heck am I thinking? Well, in order to better understand moonshine, I have two experts joining me on the show. They are from Wilderer Distillery, located in Paul, and they are Christian and Johan. Now, Wilderer does have two locations. You might have seen them at the Spice Root Farm, also home of Cape Brewing Company, CBC. And then they're also located on the R45 in between Paul and Franschhoek, quite close to Soul Barrel, in fact. Here's a special offer that we're giving you guys, the listeners of Hashtag Beer Time. If you go to any one of those two locations and you say the code word Hashtag Beer Time, you're gonna get 10% discount on the Rogue Moonshine Apple Pie. Ooh, yes, love a bit of discount, and that's lasting to the end of November 2018. So if you find yourself in the area, go on down, grab yourself a bottle, and you can get 10% discount. Woohoo! Okay, let's go on to the show and introduce to you what we have in store. Rogue Moonshine Apple Pie. My goodness, what is this? I tell you, when I first had a sip of this, I was blown away, it was incredible. I was completely converted. I wanted to know more. I spoke to Christian, who was super keen to get on the show, and we discussed the history of Wilder, the history of distilling in South Africa, and what are the techniques used in distilling. We also spoke about beer cocktails. So it was an awesome show. I thoroughly enjoyed drinking this, and I can tell you right now, this is going to be my drink for the summer of 2018. You heard it here on Hashtag Beer Time. Guys, enjoy the show. You know what time it is. What's up, beer people? If you heard it on the Hashtag Beer Time, it's true. It must be true. It's true. Uh, It is fact. Please, won't you name one of your beers Cart Horse? And just do something terrible. <laughs> just <laughs> shit beer. Yeah. Stick your finger in there every now and again. <laughs> Stir it with a yeah. sock. <laughs> every show, it feels like my first show. Every show is a new adventure. We're having some good conversation here, Mr. Troy. Did I make sense there? I think I did. Oh, I love them all. Are we off air? <laughs> Testing, testing, moonshine, moon brew, take one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hashtag Beer Time. I'm going to get straight into introducing my guests. It's a little bit of a different show. As you might know, I like to change things up now and again. We're not talking beer. Yes, we're talking beer today, but we've got a little bit of a curveball. We're talking about moonshine. And if you have no idea what it is, then well, I've got two guests here to help me uh, discover a little bit more about Moonshine. We have Christian and Johan from Wilder. Gentlemen, welcome to Hashtag Beer Time. Thanks, Troy. Thanks for having us, Troy. Yeah, so let's get straight into it. Um, it's customer on the show to just start drinking. So what do we have in front of us? What's, what are we going to start drinking first? We're going to definitely have some of our apple pie moonshine, which uh, the chat is going to be all about. Yeah. But uh, I'd like to re- reverse everything a little bit, maybe just give you a quick um, idea of who we are, actually, and, and where we come from, how we got to this, because, um, you know, this is not, not our first product. So, um, Wilder Distillery is South Africa's first private distillery. We got the first uh, private license in, in late 1994, and how it all came about was... Um, my old man Helmut, he, um, we're from Germany, and he was pretty sick and tired of his life in Germany and had restaurants there and um, weren't going too great. Uh, early 90s was a recession period in, in, in Germany. And uh, he coincidentally won a, a golf competition with a trip to South Africa. And um, <laughs> he'd never been here before, he arrived here, played golf, and uh, fell in love with the place from the first minute. And um, after his first dinner in, at Sun City in the Italian restaurant, he ordered a grappa and, and was surprised that uh, there was no local grappa available. There was a monopoly at the time, so he could get some brandy and a little bit of whiskey, maybe. And uh, that surprised him a lot because he was a, a big fan of, of Dijon Steve's and after dinner drinks, mm-hmm. grappa eau de vie and a German style fruit spirits. But anyway, I left it at that. And then, you know, during his week here, he. He had a chat with a few people and 
and on a wine farm in Stellenbosch, the Swiss owner suggested to him, you know, you've been moaning to me now for the last three hours about your horrible life in Germany and you're looking for a new opportunity. Why don't you um, um, become South Africa's first uh, private distiller and apply for a license and, and set up shop here? So he thought it was a mad idea because he didn't know anything about distilling. He just loved uh, spirits. And, uh, but anyway, so just for fun, he applied for the license, and, and as it happens, the license came through quite quickly. Nice. And, um, Must have been very quick back then in the day. Well, look, we, he was here in January 94, so it was just before the elections. Oh, sure. um, elections were in April, and um, he applied for it, I think, in, in... I think he... Well, he definitely applied before the elections already, um, but I think the license came through somewhere in June... July already, so wow. very quickly after the that elections, nice. yeah. and uh, I was 15 at the time, or 14 actually, and um, so it all happened very quick, I mean... You were with him at the time? I wasn't with him on that holiday, yeah. he came here with me in May, 94, uh, for a week, and uh, started looking for houses and stuff, and I thought that was quite odd, because um, you know, why would you want to buy a house in South Africa, it was a bit <laughs> uh, strange idea at that time, and then he said to me, he really loves it here, and... And uh, we got back, and then he kind of broke the news and said, "Listen, um, that's what I'm going to do." Pack your bags. I pack your bags, literally. And uh, six months later, we were here. So, uh, Dad and I, two suitcases and um, distillery on the water, and uh, no clue about distilling. Um, but which was more of a shock? fact that you're getting into distilling or moving to South Africa? <laughs> well, I wasn't uh, definitely didn't get in, or I didn't think I was going to get into it at that stage, uh, being 14. Um, turning 15. Every but, teenager um, thinks about getting into some form of alcohol business. <laughs> well, I, did, I, I guess I did enjoy the benefits a bit, you know, got free booze. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we arrived here, we didn't, he didn't have a clue, he uh, self-taught himself a lot of stuff, but also went back to Germany and to Austria and, and, and did every single course you can think of. Um, he did his master distiller diploma and, and master a taster, master fermenter, and okay. went even to university at age 54. Um, wow. And, um, yeah, so he became South Africa's first distiller of grappa. And that's what he focused on. And uh, German-style fruit spirits, so Williams Pear and uh, Apple and Calvados and those type of things. Uh, Himbeergeist, raspberry, apricot, uh, marille, um, uh, prune, zwetschke, and so on. Quick little question. Was, was he met with a lot of resistance? I mean, obviously, this was a new product. Yeah, so a... he, thought, he thought it's a big gap in the market. Um, but obviously it wasn't part of South African culture at all. So um, it was very difficult. I mean, we, I was involved from day one. Um, he obviously forced me to help him and after school and during holidays. And so I was always there. I uh, didn't always love it as a teenager. Um, but yeah, looking back, I mean, how fantastic the journey. Um, but I, I imagine it must have been quite, quite difficult to um, get people to introduce people into something that they're not familiar with. Definitely, 100%. I mean, we we did every single good food and wine show or, or trade show you can imagine for at least the first 10 years. And it was, you know, we couldn't afford staff or anything like that. So mm. it was always my old man and I. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, people thought, what is this? Is it vinegar? No, it's um, grappa. Oh, what's that? Grassa. Oh, lekker. I love grassa. No, not grassa. It's uh, grappa. Oh, what's that like? Is it like tequila? No, it's not. Uh, is it like brandy? Mm, well, kind of. So it was difficult to get people to understand. And obviously drinking neat spirits was not a culture. Sure. So then you would have people sample it and they would like virtually die in front of you or whatever, throw up on you. Either neck it or unsick. mix it with some Coca-Cola. So you always ask, yeah, can we yeah. mix it with Coke? Can we do this? So it was, it was tough, but okay. So you see, it was a one man show and, and he had his little business and he continued on for, for many, many years um, doing his stuff. Annual production was about 10,000 uh, bottles, um, 5,000 liters which was a lot out of the, the single distillery that we had at the time, which was a 700 liter um, copper pot, which is still the main um, production facility we use today. And um, So nothing's changed in terms of equipment? Nothing's changed. We added one small 100 liter, okay. which is um, obviously seven times smaller, so it, it does help, but I mean, we mostly use the, uh, the big one. And um, he continu continued to do his thing, and you know, it was good. We, one um, until let's say five years ago, I think he collected over 70 international medals, including many golds, double golds, Spirit of the Year, Grapple of the Year, bad. 
World Spirits Festival, London. It's Australia, almost Germany. as many awards as the uh, Carling Black Label. Well, there you go. So yeah. we, we definitely, I mean, we're still South Africa's most awarded craft distillery today on the international platform. Wow, okay. Uh, we're close to 100 awards um, uh, by now. Um, so he was doing fantastic stuff, but um, he wasn't really getting the recognition that he deserved. So he was getting it on an international platform on his quality, but also selling it internationally was extremely difficult. Okay. Germany has 66,000, sorry, 32,000 distilleries. Austria has 66,000 registered distilleries. Wow. So for us to go and export the product overseas is, is, is super difficult. Cheap I mean, yeah. you can imagine it's like um, trying to export biltong into the Karoo or something from uh, yes. from uh, Norway or whatever, or, yeah. or China. Or yes, no, no, no. The no, Oaks no. are going to look at you and go, you're mad. So for us to send Williams Pear or Opsler to, to rural Germany is is a ridiculous task. So. Yeah. Um, fast so, forward to today. What's... So fast forward. Look, basically, I went overseas. Um, I think in 2013, and and came back, and I saw international gin trend happening. And yeah. um, came back, and I said to Dad, "Listen, I think uh, gin is going to become the next big thing. We've seen craft beer, um, and following that, um, looking at international trends, it will be craft distilling. I'm 100 percent convinced, yeah. and it's going to be gin. So please make a gin." And uh, let's follow a trend. And he said, oh, I'm not interested in trends. We'll never f- make gin in my life. Not over my dead body. And it wasn't his, you know, gin and what he made before, what we still do today, what we take pride in really today in, in the grappler and the Odinese is a very different ball game. So I think um, if you can use an analogy of, of sort, making gin and making grappa is like uh, Formula One and go-karting or something. You know? So it's, it's it, it really... It, I don't want to sound arrogant or anything, but yeah. on his behalf, but it just wasn't a league that he sure, wanted to no. compete in. Okay, so um, um, different engines. He wasn't interested yeah. in doing it, so uh, he was quite stubborn and, and an artist in his way. So I couldn't get through to him and, and left it. And then the first couple of local distilleries started popping up, and um, and they got a lot of press coverage, and and they were really being celebrated as as sure. the you know the start of the new. Um, craft distilling movement and like I said we're getting a lot of attention and I said to him in another meeting I said to him dad I'm not going to let this happen you've been you are South Africa's first private distiller you are the pioneer and the father of craft distilling in this country and I'm not going to let some dude in with all respect because some, some, dude, hipster, some hipster with a with a beard and a, and a tattoo with a in some on his garage yeah. <laughs> um, become the superstar of the distilling industry. Okay, that's not going to happen. Yes. So make a gin, um, make a make the best gin. Yes. Uh, until then, there was no international. Um, there were no international medals handed out to any local gin, um, producers. So I said, make a make a gin. Let's get an international gold medal for it. And you'll get the recognition you deserve, and then you can go back to your category and do what you do. Okay. But at least people will know, okay, there's the old fox, the old German crazy guy in Paul, and he, he can if he wants to. Yes. And um, I kind of got him there, and he said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And um, then it took it took him 18 months to, to come out with a final product um, to our kind of annoyance. But as he was, you know, he was a perfectionist, so he kept changing the recipe and changing okay, and changing wow. and changing it. 18 the, months, wow. And the okay. day before launch, he emptied out all the bottles um, and redistilled it, and we pushed it out another two weeks. And sure. We launched it in December 2015, finally, and um, we got our first international medal in May, and we went on to win another three international wow. gold medals that year. So he got all the recognition that he deserved and that I hoped for. Um, newspapers and, and, and all sorts were coming out to power and, and, and aspiring distillers and, and and cool people, you know, young crowds. Uh, so this was 2016? This was in 2016. Came the start out. of the gin yeah. movement. Okay. Came out and then they wanted to meet Helmut Wilder and who this guy is and get autographs and literally and get selfies with the old man. And, and, and it was, I still get goosebumps now when I think about it. it was he, he really felt like he's... he's rock star. Uh, rock star, yeah. Nice. And uh, as hardcore as life is, he uh, was diagnosed at the same time with cancer and he died the same night. Uh, same night, same year. Same year. Sorry, so he died in December 2016. Sure. But uh, he left us with this fantastic product, fantastic legacy and, and, and recipe, and it's really put us on the map. So to give you a quick idea, from 10,000 bottles a year of, of Grappa and Eau de Vie all, com- all combined of annual production, 
first year of gin, we, we sold 32,000 bottles, and wow. last year we sold over 130,000 bottles. Jeepers, okay. So it's really done something fantastic to our business and to our brand. And you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket, and you want to keep innovating, and you want to do new stuff. So everybody's speculating the whole time, what's the next product, what's the next big thing? Is it uh, rum, like everybody's been saying for the last five years, you know? The way is it that, or is it, what is it? Uh, we think uh, it, it could be, or we just absolutely love the whole thing around moonshine. Yes. Because it's, and Johanna's going to come in now and, and give you a little bit more ideas well, there. I, yeah, I, that was, you, you spoke for at length now, and I'm so thirsty. This, thing, this <laughs> drink that we have in front of us has been looking at me. Let's, I, I, I assume we've, we've, we've got a bit of a cocktail here. Yeah. Um, Johan, do you want to kind of explain to us what, what, what's in front of me here? All right, so with the moonshine, we first had to thought of different ways how to utilize the spirit. Now, we're going to go into what the spirit is, where it comes from, and why we're calling it moonshine in South Africa in a bit. But the drink we have in front of us is a moon brew. To make it more applicable to the craft beer industry, we are thinking about how to utilize our moonshine in, in beer. Now, the perfect marriage Almost between, like a, a, mm, a cocktail. Yeah, yeah. Moon brew. So, like that. Christian and myself, we sat around the table and devised some many creative cocktail ideas. Um, we call it innovative research, which is the best, best part of my job. I think a lot of us do that in the beer. Or exactly, yeah, you need to. It's important. community. It's not only to do with quality control, but it's only also to do with trying your product. Yes. And um, concocting wacky ideas and throwing things together and um, oftentimes you struck gold. So with this moonshine, um, we made a cocktail with half a shot or a full shot of the moonshine, that's 25 mils and 25 mils of CBC Amber Vice beer. Nice. So this is craft beer and craft spirit combined into one cocktail. Um, so you're welcome to have a sip. I'm going for it. Yeah, um, go for it's, it, please. It's, for people that can't tell, I'm sure most people can't tell, but it's boiling outside, so I'm going to have a sip. Mm. Let me just quickly uh, button here again. Um, so, Go for it. So, like I said, moonshine is is very... I think I think of American hillbillies drinking mm. out of a... But everybody asks, what is moonshine? Okay, yeah. so uh, that's fantastic because now you've got somebody listening to you, and the great thing is there's no real definition around moonshine. Moonshine traditionally was obviously illegally produced alcohol somewhere in the woods um, yes. so the cops couldn't catch you they would do it in the middle of the night when it was full moon so they had some natural light so they didn't ah. draw too much attention okay. and then they would, something and then they would make it out of a homemade uh, distilling kit and uh, anything that was cheap and accessible so in the case of uh, southern america or um, north america or the southern states yes we're talking about um corn or um uh Barley. Or maize, rice. Uh, yeah. um, so, um, in our case, in the Cape, we've got an abundance of grapes. So we say we shy, we shine with wine. Um, so our base for for the for the moonshine is um, a grape spirit, a wine spirit, in other words. And then I'm going to hand over back to Johan, but I want to maybe also just to introduce Johan. So um, my father uh, took Johan under his wing. Um, Quite a few years, um, luckily, before he, he left us and um, uh, trained Johan up to become his successor and nominated him to become his successor in the distillery. I take care of, of uh, the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. I also distill. I'm obviously uh, actively involved, but Johan has joined the business as uh, also a director, and that is what he focuses on full time. He's absolutely passionate about what he does. And as you he should does, be. He does everything in helmet spirit, excuse the pun, and... Um, and he can give you a little bit more insight about the whole production process and what this apple pie moonshine actually is and why we've opted to go for an apple pie recipe because there are many different types yes. of moonshine as well. Well, I, I think to help Johan with that, I mean, I tried the apple pie moonshine on its own, I think about three weeks ago, um, and I was just blown away. Like, how did you guys come up with apple pie and how many other alterations were there before you landed on this one? Well, to be completely honest, not much. Um, the thing is about moonshine in South Africa is you need to be you need to be traditional, um, but you can't in this sense because we're not doing it the, the way that they do in the states. Mm. Uh, if you go and 
Google the, the definition of, of moonshine, you'll get to something that says moonshine is can be any alcohol, literally any alcohol, any, mm. any form, any origin. Um, so it's so quite an open category. It's a very open category. So what Christian said is that in the Cape we shine with wine. Um, for me, this is a perfect... Uh, this is a perfect marriage between something that's brewed and mm. something that's distilled. Uh, what I mean by that is how we manufacture the spirit is we take 100% pressed natural apple juice, 150 liters of that, add it to a brew pot. We reduce that with spices. Sure. All the spices you typically find in apple pie. I'm talking about cinnamon, nutmeg, yeah, yeah. Um, cardamom, cloves, ginger, and all that we reduce um, to make a syrupy con consistency, which we then laterally literally fortify with wine spirits um, to achieve an alcohol of 38 percent. Can, can, can I tell you a rewind a little bit? Where do you get, can you explain that process of that wine spirits? And I, I, forgive me, I don't know a lot about this, but how do we get, what's the process in getting that, um, the spirits, the wine spirit that you use? So wine spirits is, is very neutral and that's very important because if you're looking at uh, distilling grain spirits or cane spirits, yep. wine I find to be most neutral. That means there's no interference when you're using that spirit to fortify um, that should have any interference from wine or from grain or from whatever base it's made from. You get a very clean cut alcohol. Mm. Um, it's top quality. It's the best form of alcohol. Uh, in the industry they refer to it as A spirits. Um, and it's it's in my opinion, the best alcoholic base that you can use to fortify any liquid with. So, um, you can imagine our literally distilling wine. Can you guess how many times that's distilled? I'm, I'm going to literally stab, take a stab in the dark here. I'm going to say three. Try 150. Okay, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. What I'm that talking was about, way off, people. <laughs> yeah, what I'm talking about now is, isn't literally redistillation um, through pot still and taking it out and redistilling. What I'm talking about is fractional distillation. Mm. Uh, that's a practice we employ when we're using um, reflux columns, where we, we literally have plates inside the columns. <clears throat> Each plate um, equates to another distillation. Uh, so the manufacturers of the spirit base alcohol, they can clean the spirit to such a degree that it's 96% clean ethanol. Wow. So that is... You, that you're is, not going to drink that? No, you can't. You, you shouldn't. <laughs> you probably no, you shouldn't. <laughs> but th this, is, this is what I'm calling clean, perfect, super great, high, high quality alcohol. Yeah. And that must be manufactured on a, on a higher scale. Um, that's the base alcohol that we use in the spirit. And to be quite honest, it's, it's fantastic in what it offers in its neutrality. Mm. Uh, the focus on the spirit obviously is the apple reduction with the spices. So we're talking about apple pie flavors that we've aimed for. And, um, and so we can't use a spirit that's, that's um, tastes like grain or Yes, or no, it would, like it would, I'd, I'd imagine it would interfere. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm still blown away at how you guys got to the apple pie because I think it's, you've almost combined this food, this tasty sweet beverage, <laughs> this, right. this tasty sweet um, American uh, dessert and put it into a, a spirit and I just yeah I, I mean I, I haven't seen too many people do something like yeah. this oh, right so um, to answer your original question yeah. why apple pie um, it's a very typical American pastime apple pie is something that you associate with Americanism um, which is also one of the reasons we thought that spirit might work you get a lot of and I use the term Americanism because this is what we're seeing today mm. um, there's a big connection between what is cool today and what is what is really what's really grabbing a lot of attention and um, you get in establishments Hudson's Jerry's Burger Bar um, Burger King all this American influence that's actually making quality stuff yeah um, and that links into where society is at the moment and um, so that is why we've chosen apple pie being mm. such a typical American pastime and such an amazing flavor to incorporate into into an alcoholic beverage uh, as as a direction to go to. Initially, we thought of releasing future different variations of the moonshine, yes. all in the forms of American typical pies that you get. So this is the I've first... I've heard something like each state has its own pie. Yeah, Key no, lime sure. pie and lemon pie. And, and by the way, did you know that there's a, 
there's a law in, I think it's Wisconsin, Yes. that you're not allowed, it's illegal to serve a slice of apple pie without a piece of cheese on top. Okay. Yeah, that, that, apparently that's law. Okay. So you guys can go and check that out. Maybe we should make the law in some of our <laughs> district shows. Yeah, anyway, so... To serve yeah. shots of apple pie moonshine. Yeah, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of heritage behind apple pie. Yes. And um, the flavor of that, I find, is, is fantastic in the spirit. Well, I will say you got an absolute winner here. Um, and I'm, I mean, I have had it neat. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. But I'm really enjoying this this craft, what you call it, a, a brew, moon brew. Moon That's brew. correct. Almost like mm. a cocktail. I like the moon brew there. It's kind of, it's kind of mm. stick with me. Um, yeah. Any any plans to do something similar or bring something out further down the line? You said you were going to do different alterations. Mm. Um, but this is quite exciting. I feel that this you're almost you're tapping into like a, this new, um, maybe not a new market, but you tap it. You, you, you're awakening the the craft brewer market where guys are discovering new flavors and stuff like that. As they are in beer, as they are in so many different flavors in beer, you now introducing this whole new flavor spectrum into a different uh, industry. Um, what, what, what's, what's been the response, if I can uh, head it back to you, Christian, what's been the res- response to something like this um, from, and compare it to maybe the traditionalists because this is a very left field. Yeah, we weren't quite sure, Troy, to be honest. Um, we worked for a year on this product. Uh, way, too, way too long in our, our view, but we need to perfect it in, in, in when releasing. And... Um, we weren't sure how it's going to be perceived. Mm-hmm. Uh, perceived. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. I think Moonshine has a bad kind of perception because you know you, you, you'll think like like Vitblitz as well. Yeah, yeah. You think of that as like horrible fire water, but you know Vitblitz can be fantastic stuff, or Mampur can be fantastically made if it is done if it's fermented well and distilled well. And, and so if on. I can add, if it's packaged correctly and pre- yeah, beautifully course, presented. I mean, I mean, I think your packaging is just this beautiful box here, this uh, charcoal label. It's it. You only you only kind of see the moonshine later, but it kind of takes a um, a second (laughs) second opinion to kind of like judge that to judge that package. You look at it and you think, okay, this is a premium product. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's what we try to do, and we try to keep the whole look and feel of our premium brand, Vildra. Um, it is a new brand within the brand, let's call it. So okay. Rogue is, is, is kind of represents a new generation. It's a little bit more experimental. So we, we're calling it Rogue by Vildra. Um, but we want it to be a, a lone standing separate brand going forward. Uh, but to go back to your question, how has it been received? It's been received very well. Now, obviously, every uh, salesman is going to tell you that, but... <laughs> Uh, honestly, it, because it's so versatile, I think yes. um, it uh, you can enjoy it as a, a neat on the rocks, as as a as an aperitif. You can drink it in many different cocktail uh, versions or drinks, um, like what we're having now. I'm drinking this brew. at Christmas. This is getting drunk at Christmas. Definitely, yeah. a lot of people when they because it has Christmas spices in it. Yes. A lot of people when they first taste it, go, "Ooh, this is Christmas," especially when they taste it neat. Yeah. Uh, if you mix it with ginger ale and a dash of fresh lime juice um, and lots of ice, you all of a sudden are going to say, ooh, uh, Cancun Summertime. pool. Yeah. You know, uh, exactly. so it's, it's, it's super versatile. It can be a Christmas drink if you like. It can be a very refreshing poolside drink. Um, you can do something like a, a new fashion, which is with um, a soda water and bitters. Um, one, of, one of the f- couple cocktail ideas that we've come forward with that you'll find on our on our website and and um, that we'll, we'll suggest to you uh, for instance otherwise the kitchen the chefs mm-hmm. are loving it because um, you can do fantastic desserts with it imagine the the moonshine the Christmas spices and a chocolate sauce mm. um, anything with orange or citrus goes very well so like a Could traditional crepe suzette or yeah. uh, sorbets ice creams um, Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Something as simple as taking a, a vanilla pod ice cream, a high quality vanilla ice cream, and just drizzling some of this yes. uh, moonshine apple pie over it. Beautiful. 
Oh, okay. Well, there is something. I'm planning something on doing some desserts, but with beer. So you've, you've kind of given me an idea now uh, as to what I want to do with it. It with goes very dessert. well with beer. It goes very well with chocolate. It goes but very more well than with that, coffee. <laughs> and all those things also yes. go very well with beer again. So you can combine the moonshine, the apple pie moonshine, with chocolate, with beer, and mm. with coffee. And you can play around with these, these flavors. Okay, I'm... I'm not sure if I'll have some of this with my coffee at 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, I'm not sure Try what it, kind man. of pr productivity <laughs> I'll have with my day. But um, help, I hope, <laughs> I hope <laughs> me understand the, the procedure or the legalities maybe. Someone like me, a common Joe, I, I want to maybe try my hand at, at, at brewing some moonshine. Firstly, how easy is it? And is it legal? Can I? Is it like home brewing? Well, it's not like home brewing. Um, like I said, this product is a marriage between brewing and distilling, but it's still classified as in spirit. Uh, spirit being its, uh, its specific category is spirit aperitif, which is a gray area between 38 is, is the content of the alcohol in this product. It's a bit too low to be classified as a spirit. Yeah. The minimum is 43. Yeah. And liqueurs has a minimum or a maximum of 24. So this one falls in the gray area of between a liqueur and, and, a, spirit, and a spirit, <laughs> which is which is also what adds to the the style moonshine. Yes, um, because it doesn't really have a home. But legally wise, you would need to own a spirit producing license to produce okay. a, a spirit like this. Traditionally, moonshine has been distilled and produced illicitly in America. However, that's changed. A lot of people are producing moonshine legally now. Yeah. Um, which obviously adds to the quality because with legality comes control and with that comes quality and uh, and where we are now in 2018 is uh, is where quality has become the determining factor where the product is successful or not. Amen, yeah. Look, as far as I know, the law for if you, you, you're allowed to produce 10 liters of absolute alcohol a year without a license, but that's for personal consumption, so not for, for commercial. So let's call it, you can make something like 20, Ten liters, okay. you can probably make 25 liters, I'm saying roughly now, I didn't uh, work that out in my head now, but sure. at 38% or something, you can probably make like 25 liters of, um, of uh, moonshine, if it's at 38%, okay. uh, and you can drink it with your mates, I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a bit, that would be 50, 500 more bottles, yes. um, and you don't need a license for that. Okay, so anything above that? You do need a license, of course. If you want to commercially sell it, then you need a license for sure. Yeah, that is but, a whole bunch um, of legalities. But there. listen, if anybody is interested in, in distilling or wants to know or wants to be a part of the process or wants advice or anything, then then please, I don't know if you can share something on your on well, on, on this. Where, they where can, can contact us any time. Where can they come visit you? They can visit us um, obviously at the two distilleries that we have yep. in Pal in, in, in the Cape Winelands. Uh, so one is at Spice Root. Um, the celebrated spice route that a lot of okay. people know, especially the, the, the beer drinkers, because CBC is located yep. there. Um, otherwise, five k's down the road is our own estate, our original home, with our main plant and, and, and our main production facility that's at uh, Vildra Distillery and, and uh, Papa Grappa Restaurant. Yes, I've, be, I've been there once. On it's the way beautiful. to Franchuk. And uh, otherwise, go on our website, uh, www.vildra.co.za. Um, that, 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 that's, that's spice route. Um, visit I've, I've, that, that could be a little bit dangerous with people going from the brewery straight to you guys it's just a just as an <laughs> added and the added wine. incentive oh and there's wine and, and wine chocolates well. so um, this good for sure, everybody here. yeah but I'm, I'm, I can definitely recommend that um, I was lucky enough to have a bit of a tour at Spice Roots um, with the brewery and your distillery and it was yeah it was perfect that's it but Perfect otherwise I mean, look us up on the internet just even google us Vildra Gin Vildra Moonshine you'll find us and uh, all the email addresses you'll find online either come directly to me or to Jan and uh, we're super happy to give any advice or help or invite you to come and look and be part of the production we obviously produce um, uh, in an open environment so mm. the public can come and view and see and touch and feel and smell and talk to us and that's what it's all about so that's the concept yeah, I think it's, I think like beer, I think it's important to have that open door approach where people can get educated, people can learn more about a product. It doesn't have to be an alcohol product, it can be anything, you know, that's, you want that enthusiasm or you want that interest to grow because in doing so, it creates a, 
uh, a believer or a follower of your products that will go on to be a gospel disciple of, of your products and spread the good word. So, yeah, I can definitely see how what you guys have is very, there's a, there's a close correlation with, with the brewing industry. Um, oh, I suppose you guys just, it's always fun drinking your product. <laughs> no, guys, definitely. I think that's uh, a good place to kind of wrap it up. We've been speaking for half an hour, which is, I think it's good. Um, I'm, I've enjoyed this. My, my drink's finished. So, There's more? Um, I, yeah, I might have a little bit more. Maybe just a sneaky little bit more. Um, but yeah, guys, let me just say thank you very much for, for joining me on the show. I, I do, I do want to come out and have a, maybe a little, uh, do you call it a brew day? What do you guys call it? Um, a distillation day. Distillation yeah. day. Do you say today is distillation yeah. day? Or oh, production day. Production yeah. day. Exactly. Okay. Produce most days. So yeah, so we just want to make sure, Monday. just you know, give us a call or pop us a mail or something or whatever. Uh, mm. Social media, make sure. But otherwise, please, more than welcome, come and see us. Cool. Christian, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Johan, see you guys soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank for you, Cool. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to the show. One last thing before you take off. I've created a Patreon account. What is Patreon? Patreon is a website dedicated to artists creating content. And it gives them a platform to be able to get paid for their content. So no pressure to you guys, to my friends and my fans. But this kind of thing does help me to continue to grow and to continue to give you good content and to actually take this brand and what I'm doing to the next level. And I've got so many plans that I'm so excited to bring to you. So if you have a few minutes and if you have an extra buck to spare, I'd really appreciate you just going checking it out. But you can go check it out at Patreon and just type in uh, hashtag bear time and you'll see something there. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening, guys and girls. Make sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search for hashtag bear time. That's hashtag bear time written out in full. Hope you enjoyed the show and check you next time. Cheers.